welcome to a very special episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we usually dig up creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition game. My name is Josiah, also known here as Dungeon Dad, and today's episode is something unlike anything I have done in the past. The creature we're going to be talking about today does not come to us from an older version of D&D or even another tabletop game in general. It actually comes from a video game series. Of course, those of you who are familiar with the Dancer of the Boreal Valley know that I am of course talking about Dark Souls. In Dark Souls 3, the Dancer is a particularly challenging boss you face close to the end of the game, or much earlier if you're very confident, and I think she's got an excellent design and great potential to be used in a tabletop game. What got me thinking about this specifically was for Christmas I actually received a copy of the Dark Souls tabletop game, which is super fun and maybe I'll do a review on that later at some point if there's interest, but uh, that's not really what this video is about. But it did come with these really cool miniatures, one of which was the Dancer, which got me thinking how could I use this in a D&D game? Personally I use miniatures in all of my D&D games now and I love using miniatures, they're super fun to have on the table. And I really want to make use of this miniature because it's very cool. I'll see if I can find some photos I took of that and put them up here for you. And it just got me thinking about doing a conversion of this creature for D&D 5th edition. Honestly, I'm probably going to end up converting all of the boss monsters that come from the Dark Souls board game for use in my home D&D game. So if you guys like this video, let me know and I'll be sure to do the other ones on the channel in the future as well. And even if you're not a Dark Souls fan, you don't necessarily have to know what this creature is or what it's like in the game in order to be able to use it in your 5th edition game because what I've built here is something that I'm kind of proud of and I think it's a fun, interesting creature. And for those of you who are familiar with my channel here, you know that I usually cover what a creature can do in combat, some modifications I've made to the base creature when we're converting from a past edition, and then of course plot hooks and how to use it in your game. In today's video, we are obviously going to be skipping the modification step because this creature is built completely from scratch. So before we talk about how we can actually use this creature in our game, let's get right into... So the Dancer immediately to me, I wanted to be a powerful creature whose main focus was doing a lot of damage and being able to maneuver fairly well. She has a couple resistances and a pretty decent armor class, but it's nothing insane compared to what you might expect from other boss monsters. She's very much more offense than defense. My conversion ended up landing on CR9 for a couple reasons. One, I think that that puts her in the most usable range of creatures for everyone out there who might want to put this creature in your game. And also, that's a bit of a selfish decision because in my game where I currently need her, CR9 is what I need her to be. So if you end up liking this creature and you feel that she doesn't pack enough of a punch damage-wise, feel free to crank up some of those numbers and you can use it pretty much as is, but at a higher level. If you want to hear more about how that goes with my party, tune into the next campaign diary because that's going to happen real soon. Now some of her abilities were obviously inspired by her moves and what she does in Dark Souls 3, while others were things that I simply added because I felt that they were on theme and just improved the monster overall. For those of you who have already played Dark Souls 3, you will be aware that the Dancer is notorious for busting off these crazy combos where if one of the attacks hits you, you're basically stuck and you're going to get hit by the others and it does a fairly high amount of damage. I wanted to try to replicate that in the game as best as I could, and I felt the way to do that was with the ability I gave her called Graceful Onslaught. Essentially, whenever she makes a melee attack, if that attack hits, her next melee attack that turn is rolled with advantage. If that attack misses, her next attack this turn is rolled at disadvantage. With her multi-attack, she can use her flaming blade action twice, meaning that after her first attack, the second attack is going to be more or less likely to hit depending on how the first attack landed. I think this is interesting because it gives the players more strategic options. If you make a point of describing the second attack as being more or less likely to hit depending on whether the first attack hit or missed, the players will obviously get the idea that she rolls with advantage or disadvantage depending on the previous attack. This means that blocking or avoiding that first attack is all that much more important. So if someone has a spell or some kind of ability they can use as a reaction to add points to their armor class or to avoid a hit or possibly a bard's cutting words that might cause the first attack to miss, you want to use it on that first attack because if that one misses, then it makes the second attack less likely to hit. And I just think that's really fun. Plus combat puzzles like that during an encounter always make the party feel much more rewarded when they're able to actually figure it out and overcome. The other thing I really wanted to try to mimic from the game is her fluid and unpredictable movements. One of the toughest things about this boss in the game and one of the coolest things design wise is just how she moves. She very much slinks around the battlefield and it's kind of creepy to be honest. I mean, of course, the whole 
whole thing being is she is essentially a sword dancer, right? So I gave her an ability that whenever she makes a melee attack, she can then move up to 10 feet and does not provoke attacks of opportunity during that 10 foot movement. This allows her to be super mobile and where she's getting a couple attacks every round, she'll be able to navigate her way around the battlefield quite skillfully. And as for what her attacks actually are, let's get into that here. Uh, she has two of them at first. As I briefly mentioned, she has her flaming blade, which is an action that allows her to slash at someone with a very long scimitar. It does slashing damage as well as a bit of residual fire damage, and it has a 10 foot reach because of her peculiar posture and size. I don't believe I mentioned that, but she is in fact a large creature. Her other attack option here is to forgo her multi attack and use an ability called Executioner's Grasp. This allows her to grab someone, skewer them with her sword, and pin them to the ground doing an incredible amount of damage much more than she would be able to do with the other two attacks combined. However, it is kind of an all or nothing move where it only targets one creature and if it misses, that's it. It also has the added bonus of whoever she attacks with this after the attack is done, if it's successful that is, that creature is then knocked prone. Now something I added in that's not really part of the game but I felt worked with this creature and makes her more interesting is a counter. As a reaction, when she's targeted by a melee attack, she can counter that attack and add plus four to her armor class. What makes this different from a parry, however, though, is if that plus four is enough to block that attack from hitting her, she can then make a melee attack against the creature that just hit her with her flaming blade. So I felt that should provide a somewhat more interesting melee fight than what we get with a lot of the bigger monsters, but keeping with the true fashion of Dark Souls, as anyone who has played Dark Souls 3 or any of those games really will be able to tell you, that when you've got a boss on the ropes is when it starts to actually get hard. So I brought back a mechanic from 4th edition that you may be familiar with. When the dancer is bloodied, meaning that its health drops below that 50% threshold of its maximum value, she triggers a trait she has called Dancer's Resolve. The current creature's turn ends immediately when the dancer is bloodied, and she moves her spot in the initiative order from wherever it was so that she takes her turn next. She then uses an action that I have named Dance of Ash. Essentially what happens here is the dancer creates a black void space on the ground or whatever surface she's standing on, reaches into it, and with her offhand pulls out a second scimitar. This second sword is very similar to her first sword, except instead of dealing residual fire damage, it deals residual necrotic damage. Not only does this give her an extra type of damage to attack with, but it also gives her a third attack for her multi-attack. All of this basically meaning that she's now going to be able to do three attacks with her melee weapons every turn, and she's got some more damage diversity, and because she's doing more attacks, she'll also be able to move about the battlefield more freely. And this action doesn't only pull out the sword either, it also has an AoE effect that causes a bit of necrotic damage to anyone within 20 feet. Of course I get a dexterity save to try to shake off half of that, but it still causes some damage to everyone around and lets her pull out that second sword. However, that is her entire action for that turn. And when it comes to actions, she does in fact lose access to her Executioner's Grasp attack because she no longer has a free hand to grab somebody with. However, she instead gains an action called Erupting Blade. So again, she can do those three attacks or she can forgo all of that and just use this single move. And this move can be used up to three times a day and essentially what it encompasses is her carving up all of the floor around her within 10 feet and creating an eruption of fire and necrotic energy. This deals a significant amount of damage and can be a very useful tool for disrupting large groups of enemies, especially when she's surrounded. Now if she uses all three of her melee attacks instead, she is going to most likely output a bit more damage on average, but this attack does allow her to hit multiple enemies, so depending on how many people are around, that might be the best option. Now I feel like all of these abilities together is probably the best way that I could come up with to emulate this creature in the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition environment at least at the mid-tier level of play. However, I did add one extra ability just to kind of bring this to the next level and make things a bit more interesting. I adore the sound design in Dark Souls 3, and the dancer fight is a great example of that. During the entire battle, it almost sounds like you're underwater, like she's suppressing the sound. You can hear her heavy footsteps resonating throughout the entire chamber, and it's a super interesting design choice. Of course, in the game, this doesn't really have much of an application or mechanic. It's just kind of a neat artistic thing. However, as somewhat of a nod to that, I chose to give her an ability called Hushed Aura, and here's how it works. It creates a zone of semi-silence within 120 feet of the dancer. And what I mean by that is it's not quite a zone of silence. It's not that level of brutality, but it's going to be an obstacle for the party to overcome for sure. 
Any creatures within the zone can't hear any sound whose source is more than 15 feet away from them. So if they're trying to communicate with each other, they'll still be able to do so, but if they're more than 15 feet away, the sound is just so suppressed and muffled they won't be able to make out what the other person is saying. And if you have a bard in the party who has some abilities that rely on others being able to hear them, it's going to make things very strategic for that player who's then going to have to choose where they want to position themselves to benefit the most party members. Because the other side of this is the party isn't going to want to clump up necessarily because that's usually not a good thing when you're fighting a powerful monster, but that's something that they need to decide tactically in the moment. And they're not going to be able to communicate that with each other necessarily unless they group up within 15 feet. I kind of imagine the situation where there's like party members all 15 feet away from each other playing telephone to try to navigate the situation, but it's just something I thought would be a neat idea and it kind of forces some out of the box thinking. The other side of this too is it affects spells that have a verbal component. If someone's trying to cast a spell that has a verbal component and they have to make an attack roll, the attack roll is rolled at disadvantage and if they're casting a spell on somebody that has a save involved, the person who's saving rolls their save with advantage. So your verbal spells are getting nerfed a little bit here, not totally useless, but it's going to make you want to look for other options that don't involve that verbal component. Or at the very least, try to figure out a way around this constituency. Maybe you get more than 120 feet away to cast your spells if you have the option to. I don't think this ability is totally unfair, but I do think it adds a new level of complexity to an encounter that we don't often see in D&D. Granted, you don't necessarily want this level of complexity for every single encounter, but I think it's nice to have options sometimes. So, moving on from that though, let's get into some... The most obvious way to use this creature is as a boss monster. If you have any Dark Souls fans in your game, they will immediately recognize it and appreciate what you're doing. Now I do realize not everyone likes using referential stuff in their games, myself included, so if you do want to use this creature but you don't want to call it the Dancer of the Boreal Valley and have it kind of as a nod to Dark Souls, you could easily reskin this creature as some kind of golem or possibly an undead member of a forgotten race. Or they could fit in very well as a fey creature. I could easily see the Dancer fitting in very well as a Knight of the Unseelie Court, for example. Or, if you're familiar with some of my previous videos and you saw the one about the Frostwind Virago, maybe the Dancer is a servant of a Frostwind Virago. If you wanted to make this creature not an undead, that would be super easy. Literally just change that type to whatever you want, possibly humanoid or giant, whatever it is, and I think they would make a great kind of servant or right hand to a powerful enemy. If you're running a mid-tier campaign where that arc is going to end up topping out around level 12 or so, this could make a great boss for when the party's around level 6 or 7. I picture it kind of going down as a fight between them and the right hand of this warlord or whoever it is that they're after. You could even change up the whole thing about them not being able to speak and make them an actual NPC. Maybe there's just this weird knight who's a lot bigger and is a member of some race that no one really knows who's kind of working around in the shadows. If you were to go that route, you could even make her the boss of the campaign for a lower tier game that tops out around level 6 or 7. Ultimately though, that's up to you, and I encourage you to tell me all the different ways you can think of that you'd like to use this creature in one of your games. That is all I have for this week, so hopefully you enjoyed that, and if you're new here and you like what I do and you want to support the channel, please subscribe, that's the best way to do that. And of course, if you check the description below, I do have a link for the stat block of this monster readily available, and if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can find the premium monster manual style stat block linked on the Patreon page. And while you're down there, feel free to check out our Reddit, Discord, all that good stuff. And ultimately, I just want to say thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I will see you in the next one. Till then.